In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Water has always played an important role in sustaining life. Water is also a powerful force that can take away life. During the time of Noah, God told him to build an ark, and he did. When he finished, the animals came to the ark as well, and the rain began. Only Noah and his family were saved, and the rest of mankind was destroyed by the water. 1 Peter 3, verse 20. During the time of Moses, after the ten plagues, the Pharaoh came after Moses and his people. But Moses stretched out his hand, and it caused the Red Sea to part, and God's people crossed over on dry ground. When the Pharaoh's men tried to follow, Moses raised his hand again, and the water swallowed them up. Once again, we see water giving life to those who belong to God, and taking life from those who did not. Our next event happens around 40 years later, after the children of Israel had wandered in the wilderness. Under the new leadership of Joshua, the children of Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground with a similar miracle done at the Red Sea. But this time the water represents when the children of Israel enter the Promised Land so they can begin to conquer it. So the crossing of the Jordan marked a new beginning in the life of God's people. The cleansing of Naaman is our next event as can be seen in 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman was the commander of the army of Syria, but he was covered in leprosy, but there was no cure. However, Naaman finds out that the prophet Elisha could cure him. So he goes to Elisha, but Elisha does not come out to him, but sends word for him to dip seven times in the Jordan. At first, Naaman was mad and almost refused to follow the instructions, but his servant talked him into it. Sure enough, once he dipped seven times, his leprosy was gone. Though the water itself did not cure him, it was the place that God chose for his disease to be washed away. Thanks to his obedience to Elisha's message, his leprosy was gone. The Jews also used water to purify themselves after touching a dead body, according to Numbers 19 and Leviticus 14 through 17. According to Jewish tradition, if a man wanted to become a Jewish proselyte, he would have to be circumcised, an animal sacrifice would have to be made, and he would have to be baptized as part of his purification. Everything we have looked at regarding water so far has come from the Old Testament. After seeing how water represents life, new beginnings, and purification, this will help us to understand how water is used in the New Testament. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ, and he started baptizing people for the remission of their sins, Mark 1, verse 4. Then we read this in Matthew 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descend like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The first miracle that Jesus did after he was baptized was turning water into wine. After this, Jesus' disciples also baptized people in water. One night, Nicodemus came to Jesus to learn more about him, and Jesus made a strong statement about water and how important it would be under the new covenant. He said, Most assuredly I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, 
he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3, verse 5. After Jesus was put to death on the cross and raised from the dead, he makes another statement that we need to pay close attention to. He said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. He also said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, verse 16. So under the new covenant and by the authority of Jesus, water would become an important step in one's salvation because Jesus said that we must be baptized in water in order to enter the kingdom to be saved. We learn from Acts chapter 2 that Jesus' disciples understood this simple teaching about water because after the apostles taught the Jews that day that they had crucified their Messiah, they asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 37 through 38. So baptism is the point that our sins are removed. Once again, we see how water is being used to bring forth life, a new beginning, and purification. We see this pattern followed throughout the book of Acts. Philip baptizes the Samaritans and a eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And we can see water is involved in Acts 8, verses 36 through 39. Saul was baptized in Acts chapter 9. Next, Cornelius and his household are baptized in Acts chapter 10. In fact, Peter asked, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Acts 10, verse 47 through 48. In Acts chapter 16, Lydia and her household were baptized, and so was the jailer and his household in the middle of the night. In Acts chapter 19, some of John's disciples were baptized by the baptism Jesus commanded. Example after example shows the necessity of water baptism. If you read the first half of Romans chapter 6, you will see how baptism is described as a burial in which we are united with Christ and our old man is crucified and we die to sin and are raised up a new creature in Christ. One thing we don't want to miss from Scripture is what Paul says in Colossians 2 and verse number 11. In him you are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgive you all trespasses. This is similar to what Naaman had to do. He had to put his faith in the word that came from God through Elisha to go to the Jordan to dip seven times. Today, we must put our faith in the working of God, knowing that when we dip under the water, that God is cleansing us from our sins and is uniting us with His Son. The power is not in the water itself, but it is the place that God says all these things take place. So like Naaman, we have to be obedient to God's will. And when we obey, our sin problem is cured. Finally, I want you to listen to what Peter wrote. 1 Peter 3, verse 20. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine longsuffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as Noah and his family were saved from the wicked world through water as they were on the ark, we too are saved through water as it moves us from being stained with sin to being freed from sin. Unlike 
those Jewish purification ceremonies that only cleanse the outward part of man, the baptism Jesus commanded cleans us through and through because we are made clean through the precious blood of Jesus. So water has always been important. Without it, most things, including us, could not survive. But when we choose to ignore its importance in the salvation process and we try to leave it out, we are making the biggest mistake in our lives. Many try to say that all you have to do is pray to Jesus or ask Him to come into your heart. But these things are not found in Scripture. In fact, Saul's conversion disproves this idea altogether. Saul was on his way to Damascus when he's blinded by light from heaven. He talks to Jesus and calls Him Lord. And he even obeys Him by going into the city to wait for further instruction. He fasts and prays for three days before Ananias is sent to him. Now if anyone could have been saved by believing in Jesus and through prayer, it would have been Saul. But notice what Ananias tells him in Acts 22 verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Saul was stained with this sin despite believing in Jesus and praying for three days. His sins would not be removed until he got up and got himself baptized. Now that you know the significance of water, what are you going to do about it? God's plan of salvation is easy to understand. We must hear the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 3, verse 16. We must repent, Luke 13, 3. We must confess Jesus as our Lord, Romans 10, verse number 10. We must be baptized in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, Acts 2, verse 38. That's the easy part, because the real challenge is remaining faithful to God until the day we die, Revelation 2, verse 10. So why not obey God's plan of salvation today? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His.